Hello and God bless you. This is Cassandra here from Mount Sinai Deliverance Missionary Baptist Church in Chicago, Illinois, bringing to you today the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, May the 15th, 2022. And this is lesson number 11. And we are bringing our lessons from the Union Gospel Press Christian Life Series books. And before we get into our lesson today, I want to say hello to everyone who may be watching. I pray that all is well with you and your families. We have a wonderful lesson today, and we're going to get right into our lesson. But first, we want to bow our head in a word of prayer. We always want to ask the Spirit of the Lord to be with us in whatever we endeavor to do for Him. So let us pray at this time. Dear Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come to tell you thank you. Thank you, Father, for another opportunity, another chance to study your word. And Father, we just pray that everything is well with everyone that is watching this video today. Father, if anyone is in a special need of anything, Father, we just pray. We ask right now that you will meet that need. Father, maybe there's someone who is bereaved today. Father, we ask that you would comfort their hearts and comfort their minds during this time, Father. And then, Father God, somebody might just be sick in their body, not feeling well. Lord, we just ask that you would touch right now and allow your healing virtue to flow right to that point of need in their body. And, Father, there may be someone who is uh, in need of encouragement today. Maybe they're feeling low in spirit. Father, we ask that you would just comfort their hearts and send encouragement to them right now. Help them to understand that you are with us. You have not forsaken us. You have you are a good, good father, and we just, uh, just we can depend on you for whatever we need. So we ask that you would encourage them today, Father. And there, there may be someone, Father, that needs a financial blessing. Lord, we know that everything belongs to you. So we ask that you would open up that door for them right now, God, in Jesus' name. Give them wisdom, give them guidance and understanding, Lord. And Father, if there's someone that's watching this video that has not accepted you. Your son, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. Father, we just ask that you would touch their hearts and allow the Holy Spirit to draw them to you, Father. And we ask all this in Jesus' name and count it all done. Amen and amen. Amen. So we thank God for another opportunity to study, study God's word because God is so good that he has provided his word for us to study. And there's always something good for us in the word of God. Now in our um, lessons we are studying the book of 2 Corinthians and today's lesson is the fourth lesson um, that we have studied from 2 Corinthians and we have um, just two more to go after today and we will be done with this quarter. I'm telling you time is going so fast but we've had some really good lessons this quarter so if you have missed any, I would really encourage you to go out on YouTube and take a look. Um, it would certainly be a blessing and an encouragement to you. I'm sure of that. But now in today's lesson, uh, we uh, will talk about how we have been called to be ambassadors for Christ in this world. And we're going to get right into our lesson. And the topic of the lesson, the subject is ambassadors for Christ and the lesson text comes from 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verses 11 through 21 our related scriptures are Romans chapter 10 verses 5 through 15 1st Corinthians chapter 3 verses 5 through 9 and Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 through 22 the time is probably A.D. 56, and the place is from Macedonia. And the golden text reads, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And this is coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 21. Now today's aim is to grasp the truth that we have been commissioned to be ambassadors for Christ to the world, to understand what it means to be ambassadors for Christ, and to live daily in the realization that everything we do and say, we represent Christ and his gospel to the world. 
Now we begin our reading for today's lesson and we start with 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 11 and it reads, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Amen. Amen. Okay, so today's lesson picks up where last week's lesson ended. Um, and in, in last week's lesson, we stopped with verse number 10. And in that verse, we saw that um, there's a promise that one day we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And those who have accepted Christ will be rewarded for how we serve God with our lives. And we concluded last week that God is very concerned about how we live. Now, um, here in verse number 11, uh, we uh, read, uh, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Now, um, we um, a, a better uh, interpretation of the terror of the Lord is the fear of the Lord. Amen. And, and when we said the fear of the Lord, we're not uh, so much talking about being afraid of God as much as we're talking about um, having reverence and having awe of Him and having um, such deep uh, love for God. Amen. And for who He is. So we are, we're emphasizing love and not fear. Amen. God loves us and He wants us to love Him. But we're also talking about the awareness that God is supreme. He's above all and above everyone. He's all powerful. He is our creator and he is the creator of all things. So when we talk about um, the fear of the Lord, or the, we, we, like I said, this, the, the terror of the Lord, that's what we're talking about. The fear of the Lord. These are the things we're talking about. This is the mindset that we're talking about. And having a proper fear of the Lord prevents us from trying to be our own God. <laughs> amen. Amen. We have to watch that because that comes from a place of pride. No one can be a better God than God. Amen. Amen. And so we don't want to try to be our own gods. We must never forget that he is above us and that we answer to him. We don't just do what we want to do how we want to do it. Amen. Now, Paul is saying here because he and uh, the other ministers of the Gospels had this um, uh, fear of the Lord, this reverence of the Lord, that they, they persuade others to come to the Lord and to be reconciled with God. Amen. Their reverence and, again, this, this respect. This awe and this love of the Lord was their motivation for preaching the gospel. Amen. And, and Paul goes on to say, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So he says that God knows. Amen. God knows Paul and the ministers that are working with him. God knows their hearts and he knows their intentions. Amen. And this reminds me of uh, Psalm 139. And if you read in Psalm 139, you find out that God knows us. And he knows everything about us all. Amen. There's not even a word that we can uh, say that God does not know it in advance. Amen. He knows everything. So we cannot hide from God. We can't go any place. To hide from God. He sees all and he knows all. Amen. But Paul was saying that his hope was that in the hearts of the Corinthians. In their heart. They were uh, also aware of Paul and the ministers good intentions toward them. And that the fact that Paul was uh, preaching out from a place of integrity. Uh, he, he wasn't preaching for himself or for his own glory but it was because he had this fear this love this all respect for God and that his preaching his 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 hope was that his trust was that 
his preaching had been effective in pointing the Corinthians to God, which we know that it was. Amen. Okay, now we're going to pick up with verse number 12. And it reads, For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that we may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Amen. Okay, so now we see um, here that Paul is saying his conscience is, is clear. Amen. That he is ministering um, to the Corinthians um, with integrity. And again, like I said, not for his own personal glory. Amen. But he, he had worked extensively with the Corinthians in proclaiming uh, and explaining the gospel. We saw that um, as we looked at uh, 1 Corinthians, when we in the beginning of our quarter, some of the foundational truths that Paul had broken down for the Corinthians to help correct their behavior. But um, it, it, and, uh, it, in spite of Paul's hard work and good intentions, um, he still had critics in the church, amen, that challenged Paul's authority. You know, we, 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 um, we see that sometimes today even, amen. We have people that sit in the church and they, uh, they rebel against the teaching of the word of God. Now, in our textbook, it says here that Paul was always defending his apostolic authority to the Corinthians. Why? Because in order for people to listen to our gospel message, we need their respect. And that's so true. Paul was not trying to gain their blessing or approval for his own self-esteem. He had all the confidence he needed from the Lord. However, he wanted the Corinthians to understand that his authority came from Christ. So true, so true. Unlike his de de uh, detractors, uh, the, those, those critics of his, Paul does not ask respect based on anything superficial, but rests his claim on his integrity. The alignment of his actions with his inner conscience or heart. Amen. So, um, as we had learned from some of our earlier lessons, you know, earlier in the quarter, uh, we talked about how the Corinthians tend to be uh, impressed by outward appearances and by uh, certain styles of speech. Uh, and, and so these are things that, you know, Paul did, in their opinion, uh, did not have. And these critics, uh, they gave little uh, credence to the effect that the Holy Spirit had had on the lives of their fellow believers. Now, after all, Paul founded the church and he, he preached, he started in the synagogues preaching and, and, and then he went out of the synagogue and he brought many of the Gentiles into the faith. So um, they, they really overlooked all that. But in their estimation, Paul, he lacked the credentials of a gifted speaker or a philosopher. Uh, um, you know, sometimes people can look at you and, and if you don't have the right look or if you don't have a certain amount of charisma or, or, or uh, swagger or style, they discount you. Amen. And they, and, and they really hurt themselves when they do that because they could be missing um, the word of God for them. Amen. But anyway, they also believe, some of them, that the preaching of the cross was foolishness. Uh, they, they, they had other uh, uh, philosophies that they uh, put more uh, weight on than the gospel. And, and you know, we, we find that sometimes in churches today that there are people that there are certain parts of the gospel that they just have a little problem with. You know, some people just have a little problem with the virgin birth. They just don't believe that uh, Jesus could have come that way. They just they, they have a hard time accepting that. Amen. Because they're carnal. Really, that's what it is. Amen. But 
Even the, the resurrection. Some people can have a hard time believing that Jesus rose from the dead. How could that be? How did he rise? Amen. But he's God. Amen. Amen. And that God can do anything. Amen. Amen. But anyway, Paul was okay. He was okay with uh, the critics thinking that he wasn't polished enough or that they weren't impressed by him or even that they thought his belief in the gospel was foolish. He was okay with that. He was more concerned with the Corinthian church being strengthened and maintaining their faith in Jesus Christ and that he was uh, more concerned uh, also for new believers that would come to faith in Jesus Christ. So he wasn't concerned about the critics. He was concerned more about the believers. Amen. And keeping them strengthened and uh, in the faith of Jesus Christ and encouraged in the Lord. Okay, so we're going to pick up our reading verse number 14. And it reads, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Amen. Okay, now, now we just mentioned the fact that Paul had critics, and given the strife, amen, that Paul had to deal with from his critics, one may ask the question, why would Paul even have a desire to have fellowship with them? Well, verse number 14 gives us the answer. It's for the love of Christ. Amen. Now, for the love of Christ, that could be uh, interpreted as the love that Paul had for Christ. Or it could be interpreted as the love that Christ had for mankind. Now, most of the scholars tend to agree that Paul was really emphasizing the love that Jesus had for mankind. And that love was shown by the sacrifice of his own life. Amen. And it's this love that Christ has for mankind. And um, right here we're talking about for the Corinthians in particular. Amen. That compelled Paul to press on and to be relentless in his preaching of the gospel message in spite of the pushback that he was receiving from some and now this you know this should be an encouragement for us today when we face discouragement or disappointment in our christian lives you know for example i, I hear people say that they have experienced being hurt in the church and as a result that um shook their faith and 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 some people have turned away from the faith but i want to encourage anybody that may be hearing this your soul is too valuable amen to, to just let anything or anybody um stop you from serving christ from serving the lord um regardless of what because after all now we have to remember that people in the church are people. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And nobody is perfect. Amen. They will make mistakes. So we can't be so take it so much to heart that we turn our backs on God. Amen. And I, I'm not making light of it because I know that this is a very serious topic to many people. Amen. But I do want to encourage you to be more like Paul and not let anything separate you from the love of God. Amen. Because God always loves us. Amen. Regardless of what's going on. Amen. But Paul goes on to say um, here in verse 14, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Amen. And I want to read here in our textbook it says since Jesus died for all then all who trust in him have died with him amen all who believe are now dead to sin what a remarkable change from being dead in our sins as enemies of God amen now because of Adam 
we were dead in sin. And I want to um, just stop and say that. Amen. We were born that way. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. That's how David described himself. Amen. Amen. And that's true for all of us. Even the sweetest little baby. Amen. You said that baby hasn't done anything, but that baby has the nature. That nature of sin was born in him because of our forefather, Adam. Amen. Who sinned. Amen. And caused uh, Adam and Eve, caused us all, amen, to be born that way. He's our He's our parent, and so that's how we come. We come with his attribute of being born in sin. Amen. But, I'm going on to read. It says, but thanks to Jesus, we are now dead to sin. Amen. That means sin does not have control over us. As a result of Christ's resurrection, we are now alive in him. We died with him and were raised with him to new life. And as a reference, you can look at Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4. Since we are alive in Christ, we no longer live for ourselves. Our lives are no longer controlled by selfishness and greed, but rather by the Holy Spirit. We now live for Jesus, the one who gave us life. Amen. And it's because of Jesus' great love for us and his sacrifice for us that we live for him amen that that's that's what it's all about amen okay now we're gonna pick up with verse number 16 and it reads wherefore henceforth we know no man after the flesh yea though we have known christ after the flesh yet now henceforth know we him no more amen okay now all right, Paul is um, his 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 knowledge of the love of Christ has caused him to look at people differently. Amen, amen. So uh, he now sees people through the eyes of Jesus. Amen, amen. Even those who are not so kind to him, Paul is not looking at people based on their human attributes. Now remember that's how some of Paul's critics looked at him by his human attributes. But Paul does not look at people that way he's saying. He is not dependent on your race, your creed, your color, your wealth, your intellect, anything else. Amen. Instead, Paul sees everyone as a human soul that is in need of redemption. In other words, everyone needs Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs the Lord. Amen. And he, it goes on in verse number 16 to say, Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Amen. Now, Paul is stating that at one time, people only had an image of, of Christ from a human perspective. Now there were some in the uh, Corinthian congregation who um, they identified with Christ based on his heritage. They were Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. So they, when they, that's what they had uh, in common with Jesus. That's how they kind of identified with Jesus. And others had reportedly seen Jesus in the flesh. They were around when Jesus was uh, on the earth. Amen. And these two groups of people, I was reading in our books and our textbook, was saying that these two groups of people felt that they had some type of an advantage over the other believers. And it was only because of their physical connection, either through their uh, heritage or through the fact that they had been in his presence. That was what they were kind of built up on. But Paul is explaining that Jesus is greater. He's greater than any human descriptions or any human limitations. Amen. We don't identify with Jesus through any physical connection. No, uh-uh. We don't know him in the flesh. This is what Paul was saying. We don't know him in the flesh. 
Instead, we know him from a spiritual perspective. Amen. We know that he is the eternal son of God sent to save the world from sin and to give eternal life to all who will believe on him. Amen. And all, I said again, all mankind need Jesus. Amen. And should be um, shown mercy and compassion in the presentation of the gospel. We should not treat anybody as a less than uh, because Jesus came for all mankind, the Jew and the Gentile. Amen. It doesn't matter. Amen. Amen. God, Jesus came and he gave his life for us all. Amen. Okay, now verse number 17 reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Okay, now, all right. So, uh, that, that verse 17 starts out with the word, therefore. So, uh, this word, therefore, means that Paul is drawing a conclusion. And he's drawing a conclusion from the things we just talked about in verses 15 and 16. The fact that uh, believers in Jesus are dead to sin. And we don't live unto ourselves, but we live unto Christ. And that we have, a, have had a revelation of Jesus that goes beyond the physical. It's a spiritual revelation that he is the eternal Son of God and the Savior of the world. It's been revealed in our hearts. Amen. Now because of this, anyone who is united with Christ by faith is, the Bible tells us, a new creature or a new creation. Now a creation is something that is created by God. And only God can create. Now man can make Amen. Get mankind can take something that God has created and make something from it. But only God creates. Amen. And as a new um, creation, our sins have been taken away. Amen. Our old sinful nature has died. Amen. And we have a new nature and a new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. And our, our new nature that we have, it wants to please God. And we want to live free from sin. We have that desire. We're not trying to continue in sin. No. We want to live for the Lord now. Amen. And as part of this uh, new um, creation process, you know, after that, God no longer sees us as Sinners separated from him. Because you know sin is what had separated man from man, uh, mankind from God. Amen. Our sins had separated us. But now that Christ has paid the price for our sin, the Lord now sees us as his children. Amen. Amen. See what a change, amen, has been wrought in our lives. When we come to the Lord. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Now verse number 18 says. And all things are of God. Who hath reconciled us. To himself by Jesus Christ. And hath given to us the ministry. Of reconciliation. To wit. That God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Amen. All right. Now, we, we learn that our salvation, our becoming a new creation, this was something that was done by God. It's all God's doing. We don't have a hand in it at all. Amen. We did nothing to earn it. It's a gift. A salvation is a gift from God. Amen. And it was purchased by Jesus on the cross. Amen. Amen. So man um, um, kind of sin, again, 
This is what caused us to be separated from God. And, and the only way for man to be reconciled back to God was through his son, Jesus Christ. This was God's plan of salvation. You know, we talk about, I mentioned God's plan of salvation. But that's what it's all about. That's the only thing that was acceptable by God that will reconcile us back to God. We can't come any other way. Amen. Jesus said, amen, in the scripture, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way. Amen. This is the only way that's acceptable to God. It's like if God made a deal with us. Amen. Amen. And he said, this is my offer. Amen. And then there's no counter offer to that. You either take it or you leave it. Amen. And this is what Jesus, God did for us. He gave us a plan of salvation. And we could take it. If we're wise, we will do that. Amen. And in our textbook, it says, God reconciled the world back to himself through Jesus Christ's son. The barrier between God and man was uniquely signified by the thick curtain that hung in the Holy of Holies in the temple. You all probably remember that back when we were had lessons on from the Old Testament that uh, taught on the temple, the, the elements that were in the temple, amen, <clears throat> that God had uh, Moses to build, amen. Now this curtain prevented man from coming into the presence of God. Now there was a certain... Um, um, place in the temple where the presence of God resided and man could not come in that area amen unless unless you had a reason to come which the priests you know would come there to offer sacrifices but they could only come at a certain time amen if you came behind that curtain um, at, at, at the at, and you were not supposed to be there amen you would lose your life amen so <clears throat> That curtain was there to, to mark off that place and to prevent us, mankind or, or whoever was in the temple, from coming into the presence of God because God is a holy God. Amen. And we don't just handle God any old kind of way. We talked about that when we had a quarter where we just really went into detail on how we, we, we just don't handle God's things any kind of way. Amen. But um, picking up this reading, it says that uh, through what Jesus did on the cross, however, the curtain was torn in half. Amen. And you can find that in scripture when Jesus was crucified, how that curtain was torn in half. Amen. And that uh, that signified uh, through the work of Jesus, we have been reconciled with God and can now freely enter into his presence. That's what that tearing of that thick curtain the, uh, what that represented what that signified is that the price has been paid and now we can enter into the presence of God amen so people need to know that Jesus has paid the price for our salvation amen and we're going to talk a little bit more about that amen as we go further into our lesson amen but Paul and his um, fellow laborers they had been entrusted was sharing the good news with the world. And the same is true for all believers. We should not be satisfied that we are going to heaven, but we should want everyone else to go to heaven as well. Amen. And once we repent of our sins and we have placed our faith in Jesus, we have a responsibility to tell others that they can also be reconciled with God. All right, now we're going to pick up with verse number 20. And it reads, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. Amen. All right, so, amen. So um, um, Paul, he, here, here he's telling the Corinthians that he and the fellow ministers of the gospel are ambassadors for Christ. Amen. And, and, and many are familiar with what an ambassador is because we have ambassadors 
in our country, amen, that represent us in other countries. An ambassador is an official representative of a government to a foreign nation. In other words, it represents their government in the foreign land. Now, God's ambassadors represent the interests of God in this world. Amen. So, just like ambassadors in the natural represent the interests of our United States ambassadors, they represent the interests of United States. Amen. Whether it's to the UN or whether it's in another country, they are there representing our interests as United States citizens. And um, so this is the same idea. In the earth, we are God's ambassadors. We represent the things and the interests that are of God. And uh, we, we had discussed earlier that Paul was not concerned about uh, his own interests, whether he was liked by uh, uh, or, or, or whether his critics or whether he impressed people. That wasn't his concern. Instead, his um, uh, focus was on winning souls to Christ. Amen. And, and as an ambassador for Christ, we represent the interest of God, which is the souls of mankind. Amen. And we proclaim God's message of salvation. Since this is so important to God, I want to point out that we need to be aware that the enemy will try to prevent us from doing this, from being ambassadors and for being concerned about God's interest. He will put all kind of distractions in our way to keep our minds and our focus off of um, serving God and representing God in this earth. Amen. But and we have seen what well, Paul he had opposition as well, but he pressed on. Amen. So I want to say, let us stay encouraged in the Lord and let us keep living for God in spite of what opposition may come our way. Amen. Now, let us pick up with verse number 21. It says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of of God in him. Amen. So this verse here, number 21, it explains to us how God reconciled us through Jesus Christ. Amen. We'd already established that we had been reconciled, right? Amen. In verse number 18. But now here in verse number 21, we're seeing how this took place. Amen. Jesus was totally sinless. The Bible lets us know that uh, he knew no sin. He was totally sinless and he was perfectly righteous. And Jesus humbled himself to die on the cross. We can look at uh, the second chapter of Philippians. It talks about how Jesus humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. And he became the sacrifice for the sins of mankind. And at that time, God took the righteousness of Christ and he made it available for us. Amen. When we repent of our sin and we accept Jesus as our Savior, the righteousness of God of Christ is applied to us. And we are made acceptable to God. Amen. So we've been talking about this word righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is right standing or right relationship with God. It is important. It's so important for us to understand that we are not born righteous in the sight of God. Amen. Now, a lot of people feel like they, they when they're born, they're already righteous. But we're not righteous in the sight of God. Amen. Righteousness is not something that we can achieve on our own. We just can't say, well, I'm just going to be good enough. I'm going to practice self-control and I'm just going to be good enough so I can be righteous. No, it doesn't work that way. Amen. Why? Because God's standards of acceptance are much higher than human flesh can even attain. Amen. And because, like I said, we come here with a sin nature. So because we have a sin nature, it's impossible 
for us to even attain acceptance in the sight of God. We saw that a couple of weeks ago. We looked at the uh, we looked uh, we had a, a lesson where we studied the old covenant versus the new covenant and how the old covenant um, it had the law. Amen. That 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 which wasn't bad. Amen. The Bible says it was glorious. It was good, but it had to be executed through sinful flesh, and that's where the problem was. Amen. So we saw that with the old covenant, we God's standards are not uh, are, are such that a human flesh we just cannot attain it on our own. Amen. Amen. And we can only become righteous in the sight of God. When we receive what Jesus did for us on the cross. In other words, again, that's God's plan of salvation. That's his offer to us. We take it or we leave it. Amen. There's not a count offer. There's not, no other offer. That's the way we become righteous in the sight of God. And now people, you know, they say things, well, there are many roads. That's not what the Bible says. I'm so sorry to tell you. It doesn't say there are many roads. Jesus says, I am the way. Amen. And, and God has, uh, 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 has, has given us his son. Amen. The Bible lets us know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but shall have eternal life. And that's, that's, what, that's how we become reconciled, back in good standing with God. Amen. Okay, now. Our subject was uh, today uh, was is ambassadors for Christ, and when we read our um, aim for this lesson, we talked about um, being an ambassador, understanding the fact that we are an ambassador for Christ. So I want to read our conclusion because that brings us back to that point of us being ambassadors. Amen. So let me read that very short. Uh, um, paragraph here it says being ambassadors for Christ is both a high honor and an awesome responsibility we hold the precious precious message of eternal life in our valuable hands but whom God has commissioned he also guides and strengthens for his work amen so uh, we, we have been called to be ambassadors, to tell others about Jesus, about the saving grace of Jesus. Amen. And even though it is a, um, it can be a responsibility and a task, God will give us the strength that we need to do what he desires us to do for him. Amen. All right. Now let us go into our practical points. Amen. And practical point number one says awareness of the coming judgment should motivate believers to share the gospel. And this comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. Number two, people may choose to deride and harass you for your faith, but only God's approval matters. This comes from verses 12 and 13. Number three, Jesus died for us, so believers should now live for him out of gratitude for his love coming from verses 14 and 15 number four says Jesus does not fix up our old lives he gives us new lives when we trust in him that comes from verses 16 and 17 number five says since God has reconciled us to himself believers should share that message of reconciliation with others coming from verses 18 and 19 number six says you represent Christ everywhere you go be careful how you represent him. And that comes from verse number 20. And then finally number 7 says God has given us Christ's righteousness. Christ bore our sins on the cross. That comes from verse number 21. Now here are the questions uh, for research and discussion. Amen. I always encourage us to take a look at these questions because they will certainly give us a deeper uh, insight into the lesson and that's what we want we want to know as much about God's word as we can and then that takes us to next week's lesson which is entitled spiritual weapons and the lesson text comes from 2nd Corinthians chapter 10 
verses 1 through 12, and then verses 17 through 18. We also have some related scriptures there that we should take note of. Hey man, I hope that everyone has enjoyed the lesson today and have um, learned um, that we are ambassadors for the Lord. Amen. We're ambassadors for Christ in this earth. Amen. We are to share with others what we uh, have gained from uh, uh, serving the Lord and let people know that God has given his son and his son gave his life so that we could be reconciled with God the Father. We don't have to be estranged from him, but we can be his dear children. And this, this is God's way for us to be reconciled, that we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Amen. And I want to encourage us, let us talk to our family and to our friends, to our acquaintances, you know, and let people know, amen, that the Lord loves them. And Jesus came, he died for their sin, amen, and that um, the, we can accept Jesus today Amen And we can have our sins forgiven Amen And, and, and receive a new life in Christ um, And it's and, and so important That um, We understand it, That Jesus has given us new life God has given us new life Amen Through his son Jesus Christ Amen And that we gain uh, eternal life as well So many people when they die They expect to go to heaven But this is the way You have to accept what Jesus has done for you Amen That's the way Amen So I want to uh, encourage everybody um, To um, let's stay with God And continue to study God's word And if you have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ As your Lord and Savior I want to encourage you to do so today as we saw in our lesson today, the Lord loves you, amen, so much that he gave his only begotten son for you. And it's your opportunity now, amen, to accept Jesus Christ, to receive him as Lord, to repent of your sin, and to accept him. When you do that, amen, um, you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raising from the dead, you shall be saved. Amen. And I want to encourage you to do that at the end of this video. You'll see the scripture. Amen. Um, uh, making that clear to you. And as well as a prayer. If you don't know the right words to pray, you can use that for an example. But of course, you pray from your heart. Amen. God will hear your prayer, your sincere prayer. Amen. It doesn't have to be any exact words. But the point is that you're repenting of your sin and you're confessing that Jesus is Savior and Lord. Amen. And then after that, it's so important that you, amen, find a good church that teaches the Word of God so you can grow. Amen. And you can learn the, the things of God. Amen. And um, the Word of God has a way of cleaning up your life. The more you are in the Word, you're, you're receiving the teaching of the Word. Amen. That will clean up your life. Amen. And that will put you, um, the things that you used to do, those things, you won't even miss them anymore. Amen. God will change your desires. Amen. So that you will want to do those things that are pleasing to him. Amen. So if you um, join a, uh, find a good church to join and be part of, so you can receive teaching and you can receive instruction, such as baptism and other ordinances of the church. It's so very important that you do that. That helps you to remain strong in the Lord as well. Amen. So I encourage you to do that. Amen. Also, you'll see uh, at the end of this video, you are invited. Amen. To attend the services at Mount Sinai. Amen. If you're looking for a church home, amen, on the south side of Chicago, that's where we're located. Amen. 9900 South Luella Avenue in Chicago, Illinois. You'll see that on the screen. Amen. So feel free. Amen. If you are... Uh, not in a, a, a church home, don't have a church home, feel free to visit with us. We'll be glad to have you. Amen and amen. So again, you have seen the Sunday School lesson for next week. I pray that you will read ahead and study ahead in the lesson and that you will join me next time for Sunday School. In the meantime, I pray that the Lord will bless you, cover you, and protect you this week and that you will have a blessed week in God. Amen. God bless you. 
Have a blessed week. See you next time.